And typically, how long would this process take? You know, um, we are talking a movement because, from from my view, we we are talking a um, a process all the way from creating the debt, you know, the soft collection part of it, and ultimately the litigation and and hard litigation, as you mean. How long typically would would it get? Would it take rather for for a normal debt to get to the lit litigation stage? <laughs> Tonight, we are shining light on debt collections and ways in which this process can be made easier. This is the Private Property Podcast. I'm Dumi. Welcome. Congratulations to Kuto Ramusale for walking away with that 500 Rand cash prize from yesterday's show. Thank you so much, Kuto, for engaging with us and hope you enjoy your prize. So if you want to be like Kuto, don't miss your shot at walking away with that 500 Rand cash prize and comment as many times as you like on our Facebook feed tonight so that we can get you in line to winning that 500 Rand cash. So to set the tone for tonight's show, here's a story about Meiki, a single mother of two from Midrand who managed to change the trajectory. At the time, she was living from paycheck to paycheck and had absolutely no savings. Her credit score had suffered because of the eviction and outstanding collections, credit and medical debts. I knew that I, had to, I could not give up because I had to give my children the home they deserved, she says. To turn her situation around, Meki's first step was to improve her financial literacy. I made a decision to learn as much as I could about fi uh, personal finance, credit, debt elimination, as well as saving. I read personal development books as well as financial books so that I can write out my financial goals. Meki started to save a portion of her salary each month and created a simple budget and made steps to rebuild her credit and eliminated her debt. She has since left her government position to start her own company. I would tell other women in a similar situation never to lose hope, Meki said. They can change their financial trajectories and build financial lives for themselves and their children. If Meki did it, you can also do it. This story inspires a lot of people out there to say you can stay on top of your financial game. All you need to know is good, good financial sound advice. And that's the reason why we have the podcast. And you know that tonight we are going to give you a lot of insights because we've got two guests in studio. Our first guest is Simone Sundele. She has experience in all facets of law, but she specializes particularly in and particularly enjoys civil litigation. Simone completed her articles of clerkship and was immediately admitted as a legal practitioner and attorney at the High Court of KwaZulu Natal. Private property family, let us welcome Sune Simone. Simone, Simone, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It is an absolute pleasure. And joining you tonight on the hot seat is a gentleman who needs no introduction to our show. With five years of post-admission experience, he was fortunate to be an integral part of uh, South Africa's largest and most skilled um, levy finance team at, pr at property and property management giants known as Trafalgar Group. And he is currently, he currently holds a position as an attorney at, and property manager at Zedfin. Vincent, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Hi to me, thanks. Good to be back. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. You know, as when we have two guests, we definitely um, know that we bring that that knowledge and that insight together for us to, you know, to give to our viewers tonight. So I will jump straight into our subject tonight and talk soft debt collection. What is it? And and Simone, you can you can handle this one to say what is it and how does it look and why is it called soft. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, essentially soft debt collection is the process that 
uh, a debt collectors or an attorney would undergo before they proceed all the way to court. So it's those phone calls, those SMSs, those WhatsApps or emails that you would get encouraging a debtor to pay or settle entirely or make some kind of arrangement and try to get their debt resolved. Um, I think it would be called soft because it's a, in comparison to what litigation actually is, it's um, a much easier way of, of engaging with the debtor and having the debtor, um, encouraging the debtor rather to settle. Sure. And when you say it's, it's kind of, um, it's the first steps. And uh, is there any other thing, right, that we look at as soft collection in that you didn't mention, maybe um, just to give the viewers an overview of it? So soft collection, um, well, there's, there's various forms of soft collection. Uh, mm. where we look at your basic forms, for example, your telephone calls, your SMSs, your WhatsApps. A lot of the times we, especially at CDS, the firm that we, we deal with, um, they would engage with the data on Facebook or on LinkedIn or on social media. Anything that one can do mm. to get the data to acknowledge that, yes, I've got a debt that I need to now resolve. And instead of allowing these debt collectors to take me to court or having to run up and down to court because an attorney has now issued summons, I would rather engage with them to make some kind of payment arrangement or settle in its entirety. Yeah. Um, Vincent, to bring you in here, what happens now when one has gone into the process of litigation? Because um, uh, Simone has explained a little bit in terms of soft collections. Let's talk now litigation. Once it has gotten into the process, how does it look and how, why is it fundamentally different from um, soft collections? Uh, to me, I think in, in, in that context, the reality is, and, and especially from my context as well, coming from a, a company where we provide specialist um, project loans and finance to body corporates and homeowners associations. Um, you know, the reality is that most of these schemes are managed by managing agents, as opposed to 95, maybe 90% of them, some are self-managed. Um, but, you know, it's, it's also a function of these managing agents to, to kind of collect levies. Um, and, and a large part of the time, the members in these buildings and the trustees rely on these managing agents to collect levies. But in saying that a managing agent has managing agent functions and they're not debt collectors, um, although they do offer the services, you know, they're not, they're not your, your managing agent debt collectors. They've got all other sort of administrative functions. So I think, you know, from that point of view, um, you know, litigation kind of comes once your managing agents or your debt collectors, as Simone explained, it, it has kind of failed in, in doing that soft collection part. And it does fail. Um, there is definitely no silver bullet to it. And I think it doesn't take away what you would call in inverted commas hard hard collection which is more your litigation going to court kind of a thing um, but i think the biggest difference in reality is that that litigation costs a lot of money um, litigation is generically expensive you know whereas soft collection is is kind of a means you take to to prevent upfront costs because remember for a lot of these buildings and you know where there's a lot of debtors um, there's cash flow constraints because you're not collecting money so collecting money costs money, um, and that would be the big difference in that litigation costs money and time. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in a in a world, and I'd say country particularly where legal system is you know completely on the ball. Simone and I know that firsthand. So you're dealing with delays, you're dealing with um, you know deficiencies in the system. So I think time, money would probably be the biggest differences um, between yes. soft collection and and going full steam litigation. And typically, how long would this process take? You know, um, we are talking a movement because from from my view, we are, we are talking a, um, a process all the way from creating the debt, you know, the soft collection part of it, and ultimately the litigation and, and hard litigation, as you mean. How long typically would, would it get, would it take rather for, for a normal debt to get to the lit litigation stage? Um, that's for you, Vincent. I sorry. think that's... Uh, no problem. I think that's uh, that Simone come in at any time, but I think that's kind of dependent on on the specific people in in question to me because you will have buildings mm -hmm. will give debtors quite a bit of rope and and time to settle debts and arrangements and so forth, and then you'll have other buildings that don't tolerate anything more than one month in arrears. You know, so in in my experience, if you if from a levy context, which I suppose is relevant to Simone's a specialist levy collection attorney, and and I did a lot of levy collections prior and and do it at the moment more in house legal, but you know, from a, from a levy point of view, generally looking at anything 
from one month in arrear to maybe two months should be going to soft collection and body corporate should be actively looking at that because you know the moment someone hasn't paid for two months it's kind of a red flag mm. um and in mm. my experience that's kind of the window and then i suppose the reality is for litigation it, it, it's very little makes very little sense for you to litigate on small amounts as crazy as that sounds um, you know, because once you start issuing summonses and all sorts of things, you'll find very quickly that your legal fees quickly exceed the amount that's actually due. Mm. Um, so I think that's mm. why soft collection has a very good place in the market. I don't think people use it enough. Um, and I don't think people know enough about it. So yeah, from, from my side, that would kind of be the time limits, but it, it all depends. It depends on the client. It depends what they need. It depends on the building's preferences. It, it, there's no one hard, fast rule in terms of the time period. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, Simone? and uh, sorry, oh, just you... to add to, sorry, Jimmy, just to add very quickly, um, in respect of the time frame for debt collection, you're looking at around about 14 days because usually what would happen, especially with levy collections, is you would have to send out your Section 254 notice, which then affords the debtor 14 days within which to respond to that notice. It's tantamount to a letter of demand. So as debt collectors, they would then engage in all those manners of debt collecting for those 14 days. Not to say that if you don't correspond with the debt collector, you're suddenly, uh, you, you cannot correspond afterwards. Of course you can, but now you run the risk of the matter going into litigation, having your file formally handed over to an attorney who's really not going to take your telephone calls too often. They would rather just make the money and push out the summons. So in terms of costing, you're also looking at where at soft collection, you have a normal debt collection tariff, which comes straight from the Debt Collectors Act. Uh, you're looking at a total of about 405 Rand, whereas with litigation, just purely to push out the initial court processes, you're looking at um, maybe a cost of between 1,000 to 2,500 Rand, once again, depending on which attorneys you take. So mm. once again, as Vincent said, there, that's one of the biggest concerns that we have um, in that, you know, the costing is also a big problem. And what advice, um, Simone, would you give to somebody who is probably a, a, a tenant or even a homeowner, you know, who just, who's fallen behind on their payments for, what it, for, for one reason or the other, you know, with COVID and COVID hitting and all of these changes that are happening in, in, the, in the industry now, people are really feeling that pinch. What would you, what advice would you give somebody to, who has fallen behind on their payment? What are the steps that they can take for them to avoid these um, processes? Because I can imagine that these processes are quite um, heavy and tedious and even really impacting on one's um, credit score. Mm. So I, I think my, um, my best piece of advice would to be communicate. Don't leave it for months and months on end until you are dragged down to court or you're suddenly blacklisted, etc. Rather communicate firsthand. If you are a tenant who cannot afford to pay the rentals as per your lease agreement because COVID has hit, maybe you've lost your job, or maybe you're a unit owner who then can't afford to pay on the levies. Don't leave it to go into three or four months where the, the, the body corporate or the landlord thinks that you don't really care about the arrears that you are now accumulating. Mm -hmm. So the first thing to do is to communicate, send an email. Uh, we would obviously in the profession always say, record everything in writing. So send an email, send a WhatsApp, make sure you save the messages, try to engage with the landlord or the body corporate or the managing agent, whoever it may be, and tell them your story. Because more often than not, especially in this climate when, where there's COVID, the main aim is to ensure that money comes in. A lot mm. of the times, as Vincent explained, we have uh, body corporates where there might be some kind of deficit in their budget. So their main aim is not to spend too much money on litigation. They would rather you say to them, okay, I will pay X amount towards my arrears. This is all I can afford because I've lost my job or I'm yeah. now living on one salary in the household, something like that. So point one, communicate. Uh, point two, do it quickly. Um, yeah. And obviously, point three, be open and honest. Uh, you, I know that we're in the profession and, you know, we, we come across as shocks <laughs> a lot of the <laughs> time. But if you are open and honest with your story, then we are all humans at the end of the day and we can empathize. We understand when people have lost their jobs. It could happen mm. to anybody. So I think for those three, those three points are the most important ones. 
Thank you so much for that. And I'm sure somebody who's watching is really, really benefiting. Someone who might just be in that situation. And if you want to engage with us um, to, with regards to this topic, if you have comments, you've got questions, please put them on the feed so that we can field them before we wrap the conversation up. Vincent, you spoke a little bit about um, levies and body corporate levies and home association levies. And I want us to just tackle that a bit to say, how will a homeowner or how will the owner be affected, you know, with, with if they fail to pay um, these levies and these, these homeowners association um, um, levies and all these um, rates that they need to pay? Um, to me... Uh, uh... I think it ties into what Simone said, and I promise you it's not rehearsed because I hadn't seen her before we logged on the call, but the <laughs> reality is that communication is very key. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, I've seen it often, you know, debtors go quiet and, and it, it might be that some don't care, but I think in, in, in just in general terms, they just don't actually know what to do. It's kind of like a monkey on your back and you don't know what to do about it. Um, you know, in, in a levy context, it's a topic that we can discuss for, for hours and hours, but just, you know, briefly, levies are a function of a body corporate expense and HOA is to a lesser degree, but similarly, you know, in the moment people aren't paying, it creates massive cash flow problems. It leads to debts not being paid and it just leads to a mess in body corporates and it can become a mess quite quickly. Um, you know, so in, in terms of owners being affected, owners can be affected massively. Um, you know, I say that because you're looking at blacklistings on your names of credit bureau. You're looking at legal action, which effectively could lead to your property being attached. Um, you know, properties get attached daily. You can you can go onto any sheriff's website or newspapers and check your fund sale and executions on properties daily. Generally, through the banks and 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 debt collection attorneys for for some sort of credit or debt. So it's it's a massive thing in terms of credit records. Um, you know, those kind of things are listed on credit bureaus and they stay there. So you know, apart from creating cash flow problems in the scheme um, and, and probably being, you know, causing other members in your complex to be very frustrated with you. Um, you know, you're looking at those other implications, which are massive, massive for your future credit, massive for your ability to purchase things in future. And, and I don't think people realize that. So yeah, I would say that's probably the biggest um, consideration that defaulting members in, in body corporates need to think about. Cool. Thank you so much for that. And um, there's a quick question that came in from social media. And um, Glenn Majosi is asking, can, can they evict you when you send an email stating that you can't pay the levies? Um, Simone? Uh, look, I don't know the entire facts of the situation, so mm. I, I can't really give a full opinion. But in general, any lease agreement has a breach clause. And usually... Um, you know, in particular, if it's read with the Consumer Protection Act, there would be a, a time frame that's afforded for the tenant to rectify their breach. So naturally, every landlord would then, like I said, so in the beginning, communicate with the tenant and advise that, look, you are now in arrears. Um, you know, I'm giving you X amount of time to, to rectify that arrears. And if you don't, then I'm going to have to uh, pursue legal action to evict. Mm. Now, remember that they can't just pitch up with a, a bunch of guys and say, look, you've got to leave. That's not allowed. You have to get a formal court order. Um, but I think in respect of the email, look, I'm, I'm happy that you did, in fact, already take the first point and start communicating. Mm. But it does, it does not say that the landlord can then evict you because you're saying you can no longer afford your rentals. It's um, a part and parcel deal. The landlord must take that into consideration, but you as well as a tenant need to, in all fairness, take that into consideration and, and look at whether you can in fact maintain this property or whether it would be fair for you as a tenant who can no longer afford to pay the stipulated rental, whether it would be fair for you to continue to reside there. Is there alternative accommodation you can get, maybe something cheaper, etc. So take the opportunity, my advice uh, would be to take the opportunity to engage with the landlord and see what kind of arrangement the two of you can come up with. If there's any arrears, you can make an arrangement for the arrears. Maybe you can start looking for some other property or maybe you can say, well, give me a rental rebate or reduction for the next three months because I'm looking for a job, etc. So it really does come down to communication and keep that line of communication open. Sure. Um, I'm you taking... just add there to me. Yes. Um, Go ahead, please. Just, just briefly. I think the distinction also needs to be made between levies and, and, and rental. 
You know, if, if you're paying mm. levies by implication, you're an owner in the scheme and you can't be evicted from your own property. You own mm. that property. Yeah. Um, so there's other procedures relating to non-payment of levies and that would generally lead to the selling of the unit in execution to recoup um, a real levies, whereas, whereas rental, I uh, know is obviously a different story and Simone has explained that fully. So, so listeners or, or, or viewers just need to bear that in mind. If you're paying levies, um, you, you definitely can't be evicted. You own that property and you should have a title deed for that property. Sure. No, thank you so much for that. Um, before I let you guys go, one more question. And and Vincent, I'll, I'll feel this your way. And um, Polinankos is asking, how long is the grace period generally if you are unable to pay in the next coming months? And I'm guessing this is rent. To me, it, it, I think Simone explained large part of this, but it would also largely, you know, relate to the, the landlord's workings and how they work. Um, you know, from like from a le from a levy example, to be honest, you know, most managing agents, you know, kind of would give you till the seventh of the month to pay, albeit levies are due on the first of the month as is rental. Um, so it, it's kind of dependent on clients in terms of, or not clients, I say landlords and, and managing agents and trustees by implication on how they want to operate those kind of grace periods. Um, so there is no fixed answer. Um, but I think a big myth in industry is that levies are due on the 7th and so is rental, which is not actually factual. Um, these things are invoiced and due on the 1st of the month, but the whole country kind of has the 7th in their mind because I think a lot of credit providers kind of give you till the 7th to pay. Um, mm -hmm. So it will depend on the, you know, on the, on the credit provider, say credit provider or, or body corporate managing agent or whoever the case is. Thank you so much for that, Vince. And thank you so much, um, Simone, as well, for coming through and just giving us these insights. I'm sure someone who's sitting at home and who might be in this situation it has learned so much, you know. Communication is important. Actually, we had a comment where somebody was like, the three points you guys gave us tonight were absolutely amazing and they will help, you know, help someone in terms of making that decision on how to handle debt. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us and have a great night. Thanks, Tumi. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. I am sure your ears are itching to know who won tonight's 500 Rand cash prize. And I am going to tell you up the scores <laughs> and let you guys know who that person is. Give me a second. The drum roll can come through. And the winner of tonight's 500 Rand cash prize is Mukhale Mukhale. So I'm guessing that Mukhale Mukhale is going to have a beautiful pre weekend <laughs> tonight. Well, enjoy your prize and thank you so much for engaging with us on the socials. If you want to be like him, join us tomorrow right here on the Private Property Podcast at 7 p.m. and engage with us. Comment. Let us know if you like our new format. We've changed things around just for you. My name is Tumi. Have a beautiful night and thank you for joining us. <laughs>